good. This, uh, uh, you know, we've talked a lot, studied a lot about unity and fellowship and everything, so this is a good song for us. And so, uh, let's see, let's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do all three verses, okay? Good, we got a few more women migrating in. Just drinking our female voices, that's good. All right, ready? What a fellowship, what a joy divine meaning of the everlasting heart. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine meaning of the everlasting heart. Go with me, 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 safe and secure from all. this evening and as we go through this midweek service we pray that we would uh, open our hearts and open our minds and be receptive to your word so that we might carry it with us as we go about our daily lives and and that your light might shine we're thankful for everyone here for all the prayers you've answered we have so much to be thankful for and we humbly come to you and and praise your name and we pray that throughout this class and this meeting that we have that we, your name might be glorified and praised above all these things we pray in Jesus name amen
We're ready to begin tonight, and uh, if you're following there in the outline, uh, we're ready to begin in the C section of Roman numeral 4, reaching out to the community and the world. We looked at last week, if you remember, that first of all, if we're going to reach out, we must have a basic attitude, an attitude toward others that is interested in doing good, that really cares about other people. And then we looked at at the end of class uh, last week that we, ought to, we have a special relationship with the brothers and sisters as we reach out and we serve each other and we work together. So tonight we want to kind of wrap that section up and maybe move into the next one unless I get too winded or y'all ask too many questions or whatever. Uh, what's important when we talk about, when we think about reaching out to the community and the world? What's our responsibility? What? What should we even be thinking about as we do that? As I was looking at this and been thinking about this on top of what we've already talked about, uh, there's some things that come out to my mind that I would like to share with you that are, are reflected somewhat in the text, but uh, as we move along, you'll see this. So first of all, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, and somebody read verses 13 through 20. Okay, that's kind of heavy if you listen to it and really think about it a minute, isn't it? First of all, what does he start out with saying? Submit to who? To authorities, right? Submit to authorities. In our culture today, if you turn the news on very much and listen to very much, even sometimes if we talk among ourselves, we get caught up in running everybody down, you know, talking about how bad the government is. And, and I'm not saying the government's good necessarily. That's not the point. But if we really submit to the government, or those in authority, if we're really subordinate to them, what does that say to us in our life? It seems to me like there's a basic attitude that we need to catch here that we need to see. Not necessarily as we submit do we necessarily do everything that they say. Sometimes we can't. Maybe as a Christian, sometimes they ask us to do something that we can't. But that gives us no right, if I understand what Peter's saying, to take an attitude of insubordination or a lack of submitting to or honoring them in place of authority. And so as we look about it, as we think about it, I think we need to really think about that and realize. It seems to me like he's saying, as we start thinking about reaching out in the community, we start thinking about, and we should have, I think, a desire to bring everybody to Christ, for everybody to see the value of being a Christian, right? But one of the places that's really important is that we begin to think about, right to start with, that we convey how we submit, how we submit, subordinate ourselves into those in authority, the governor, whoever you want to pick up, as you want to talk about. So how do we do that? How do we, what's important as we think about doing that, that is, what's that basic attitude that we ought to catch, that we ought to have, that is going to have an impact in the world, and it has an impact even among us? Ken. Person, but what, what he is, what he does, and he does, or whatever. 
Okay. Anything else? Humble yourself. <laughs> In other words, get self out of the picture. Uh, what is wrong to us as Christians about having an attitude of submissing to those in authority, of being subordinate to them, placing ourselves under them? That doesn't mean if, if they're, I have to do, as I said already, that doesn't necessarily mean that I have an attitude that I have to do everything they say. But I don't have to, you know, Lorona tells me a lot of things to do, and I try to be subordinate. I try to submit. But sometimes <laughs> I can't do it. Now, not really, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I better do it. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at? Sometimes things come up that you cannot do even. That you, as a matter of conscience you can't do. But how many times do we become ineffective in our culture in our world, in our communities, or even uh, in the different things we're a part of, when we become kind of a rebel mindset, like we're fed up with it, we're not going to, we're going to kick them out, or whatever. And there's a way in our system, the way in our government to take care of that. Okay, so where should we be? Not seems to me like that we need to take the attitude. We need to see the attitude he's getting here. Now, our best basic attitude is submit as best we can as long as and I, you know we certainly we need to qualify that there's always a qualify as long as I do not have to do something that violates my basic penance of life and kind of what Ken was talking about it doesn't violate me doing the thing what's the basic to attitude remember what our attitude toward everybody is to love to honor to be kind to to be gentle as long as they're not forcing me to do something like that, why should I not submit? Something that is not against what we are as Christians, what I am as a, as a Christian in, in the inner being. Uh, even sometimes, I heard a fellow say one time not too long ago that even though uh, somebody was asking, in fact, it was in a sermon, I think, that we heard here not too long ago, uh, somebody was asked, you know, that they were came to Christ, they came to the, and they decided that they wanted to see do it that way, but then they went back to serve under the king. Remember that? And he said, go ahead, as long as. <laughs> you know, that's the whole point. We do not have to, and we get caught up in our culture kind of a, uh, maybe this is a pet peeve of mine, but I've gotten that way because I listen to you so much that we get an attitude of rebellion, an attitude of rejecting those in authority. And people, I believe when we do that, we're not going to be able to reach out to the world. People need to see us as people that really care about everybody, as Ken said. Uh, people that really love everybody and so deeply that we're willing to do good to everybody. We're willing. That's our heart. That's our desire to be kind and gentle and patient and, and uh, work through whatever we have to work through. Now, yes? Right. 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 That's, that's a very good point. It's always, in fact, that's what we ought to be <laughs> about all the time, right? It's because of our relationship with the Lord. And we'll, if we get there into the next section, we're going to talk a lot about that uh, tonight. But that's really critical that we start to see that. The other thing he says here that I think is significant that we really look at, that, we should, that we're free. I'm free to be whatever I want to be. But he says don't use that freedom in such a way that we don't honor all men, that we don't live the kind of person we ought to be. Uh, instead, he says, become a bond slave or a bond servant of God. So why do I submit? Even if I'm free, if I don't have to, if I'm, a, if I'm hearing what he's saying, if I'm a bond servant of God, and he says submit to those in authority, what do I do? I do it as a bond servant, as bonded with him. Uh, and we talk a lot about that, and I, 
I guess sometimes we, it seems to me like we get into talking in religious, is a phrase I've learned to use a lot. We get to talk into religious kind of things, you know. And, uh, we uh, talk about, you know, honoring God, and we talk about God's in control, and God's, <laughs> you know, he's the all-being and everything. And then we turn around and start trying to take care of things ourselves instead of letting him take care of the world and us being the kind of people who are loving and kind and good, people who will be respected in any culture. Does that make sense? That's what being a subordinate is about. That's what being a bond servant of God is about. And then lastly he said, and I don't want to spend very much time on that, but lastly he says in this verse, honor all men. Not just those we agree with, not just those we think are good people, those rich or whatever. He says, honor all men. Who does that leave out? All kind of touches everybody, I think. And so we should have an attitude, if we're going to reach out in the world, I think it becomes very clear that we should be the kind of people that honor all men. We're not interested in putting ourselves upon anybody. We're not interested in trying to control things in the way that our culture sometimes does. But instead, our focus is on honoring all men. Our focus in it is everywhere we can, being in submission, placing ourselves under. Even though we might not like what's going on, we still live in this country, we're still a part of the country, we're still a part of this community, and we should live in every way that we can in subordination to that as long as that's there. Now, the beauty of this country, you know, I don't want anybody to get the idea that we shouldn't ever desire to change. We, it, we should. But in this country, we have a beautiful thing that we're able to do that through the ballot box and through talking to one another because of our free speech. And so as we do that, as we live in that life, if we don't like something the government's doing, we think they're maybe too harsh or maybe they're, they're giving one group preference for somebody else or whatever, then how do we change it? By doing good, by being kind, by being gentle, voting even in that way, uh, and talking to people even that we'd like to see change in that way. Is that making sense? People, I think as I've looked at this, as we studied for this class, I think it becomes very fundamental that we have an attitude as a brotherhood, and our hope is that this congregation will be a congregation that really becomes a kind of congregation that this community sees us as people who are not rebels. We're not trying to revolt. We're not trying to uh, put ourselves upon everybody. We're just trying to show that we love God, that we're living according to his will, and that we love everybody. I think if we do that, now you take my think and $2 and get you a cup of coffee at some places, not many, but uh, if we do that, then we're going to start to have an effect. And I think that's one of the best ways that we can reach out, that we can get to the point that we actually become servants in the community, is we take a sub submissive attitude, we take an honoring all men kind of attitude. Of course, it goes back where we first covered in this. If we don't do that, we're missing God's plan for, for mankind. That all mankind should honor each other in that way. Anybody have a thought or question? In fact, I've heard <clears throat> said all my life, and you've probably had people tell you that, I don't want to be any part of that group because they're mean people. They're judgmental people. They're backbiting people or, you know, they're gossips or whatever that you'll hear in, in the communities. Uh, when they're saying that about us, we've got a problem. Uh, sometimes it might be a lie, but typically it's not. Usually it's right. 
when they see us fighting and fussing, not being a, a honoring people, a submitting people, a people who really are focused on what we're all about, of being kind and gentle to everybody, of honoring everybody, and they start to see us fussing and fighting with each other, how in the world are they going to want to be a part of us? As we think about reaching out in the community, and we'll cover this a little bit more in detail later, but how in the world are they going to want to be a part of us? How in the world are they going to want to say, those are good people or people to pay attention to? And I'm not so sure, again, it's just a thought, I'm not so sure that even the government, those people who we're having to submit, submit to, <laughs> that sometimes we'll be tempted to question, I'm not so sure that if they really saw us as that kind of people, people who are subordinate, subordinating kind of people, people who are honoring everybody, people who are loving, who are kind, gentle, want best for everybody, whatever. I'm not so sure that might have more effect than we realize. I think it would when they see us as that kind of people. Now let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, go a little further over, verse 17 and 18. Again, somebody read that. First Peter to What did I say? It's better to suffer, right? If we're suffering because, let's back up and get verse 15 with it. It says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience. What's that saying to us? When we set him apart, sanctify him in our heart as who we are, then when people slander us or they say bad things about us, how do, they, how do we take it? We stay focused on, it says clear, it's better that we should suffer for doing what's right than doing what's wrong. For Christ died, verse 18 goes on to say, for Christ died for our sins once for all, for the just and the unjust, in which he might bring into God and being have put to death the deeds of the flesh that made alive in the Spirit. I think there's a deep message there for us as we think about reaching out in the community. Yes, sometimes we're going to be mistreated. Yes, sometimes we might be slandered. They might say to us, I've heard that all my life when I was a teenager. Well, you're just a goody-goody two-shoes, you know. You won't do this with us because... That's slander, right? I take that. I don't get <laughs> bent out of shape. I don't quit loving them. I don't quit caring about them. I don't quit honoring them as a person, as somebody that's created to be the image of God, and so on. I don't know how that strikes you, but that's something we really need to focus on. If we're going to reach out in the world, even if we're mistreated, we don't return evil. We don't lash back. We don't try to get even or, or whatever the temptation is. Right? That's a different kind of person <laughs> than you're being talked about in the general media, isn't it? It's very much a different kind of person. Galatians 6, verse 10. We've read that, so I no need to back up and read it, I don't guess. I think we probably know that. Anybody know what that says?
That's the whole point, if I understand it. Do good to all men. Doesn't matter who they are. Uh, even if they're mistreating us, do good to them. That's key, yes. Yeah, that's, as, as we talk about this tonight, it kind of brings to mind Jesus, we're ambassadors for Christ. Right. And a lot of times we forget that ambassadors, we, we, we forget that everything we step in, mercy, warriors, anything else. Good point. And so this do good to all, it's not some shallow, empty kind of thing. It becomes a very deep thing that seems to me like we need to take this on wholeheartedly. And if we're thinking about having an effect in the world, and hopefully we all do, one of the places we're going to need to start is right there. This attitude that is submitting, that's interested in doing good, even if we're mistreated, we still focused on doing good. And I love the ambassador illustration. That's exactly right. That's a good point. But the neat thing about that, and we'll come to that later on tonight, the neat thing about that is when I become that kind of person, I become somebody. Not, not I did it on my own, but I really become somebody that people are interested in listening to, that people want to pay attention to. They want to know, and you'll see that I think clearly as we move on. They want to know what's making me tick. If I can do good to somebody that's mistreating me, <laughs> it's going to make... If you're mistreating me and you're doing good to me, I can't help but stop and think, well, why in the world is he doing so good? Why is he doing good to me when I've tried to destroy him uh, or whatever? And we see that going on a lot in our culture. The next verse I'd like to look at, and you probably think I'm crazy for putting this in here, but I think it becomes very relevant. In James chapter 2, verse 18 and 20, he's talking about having faith, and he says there toward the end of that, Show me your faith by your works. Faith without works is dead. And I want us to think about that, and I, that maybe is taking that scripture a little bit out of context, but there's a principle there that is very relevant to what we're talking about. It would be real easy for us to sit here tonight and say, yeah, the scripture says, Peter said, yeah, Peter said this, yeah, I'm gonna, I can be mistreated, but I still need to do good. I can believe that forever if it doesn't produce in my life. If I don't become the kind of person that puts it into my life, then what does it do for me? James says it's useless. It's worthless. And I think sometimes in the church we're tempted with that kind of thing. Uh, to talk the talk, but not walk in the walk. Uh, it's so easy to do that. But it's not easy to do it when we really... Uh, Get the right kind of focus that we're talking about. So what are we saying now? We're going to come on to evangelism later, so uh, I want to kind of hold off on most of that, of the reaching out uh, in an evangelistic way. So what does all this say to us when we look at what's our attitude? What should be our relationship as we reach out to others and we serve with ourselves, people in general, or the world? It seems to me like this says to us that God-driven involvement in the world begins with a kind of person 
And then we use the gifts that we have. And you'll see that as we move on into the, the church at Letters Night. But we use the individual gifts that we have to serve and reach out. And that really, to a large extent, becomes evangelism when we do that. Uh, and so we'll cover that quite a bit later. Uh, the next scripture I want us to look at is Matthew chapter 23, verse 15. Uh, and again, you may think, well, why in the world did you put that in here? But I think it'll make sense when you see it. Somebody read that. Matthew 23, verse 15. Pretty, pretty strong, isn't it? We can bring people in. If we make this application in our life today, and I think we should, if we make this applicable in our life today, we can go out and, and bring people into the church. We can go out and knock doors, doors and bring them in. We can almost drag them in, stick them in the water, and set them in the pew, and then start doing things to them. That happens sometimes. He said, watch out. If you bring someone in, if we go out, even in doing some of the things we've talked about, we get them to pay attention to us, and then we bring them in, and I guess just to, so we can really take it home, and they come in, and they start fussing and fighting, and I start showing I don't like old JD, I don't like old so-and-so, I don't like her, I don't like him. Uh, I'm mad at him because he didn't pay for the pews, but you know, I don't really get all tangled up. And we bring this person in, and we start showing hate, dislike. We start showing fussing and fighting. What have we done to that person? If we brought them in for that environment, we've done, I think, exactly what he's talking about here. We, if we're not very careful, have made them more a child of hell than they were before they ever came. And I, I wanted to put this in here just as kind of a word of caution. What we do with new converts, how we treat them, even with the baggage that they're, they're going to walk in with, becoming very important because we don't treat them in the way we've been talking about in a loving, kind, and gentle a way that honors Christ a way that, as we've mentioned, Christ is the focus that we are, even then still we're ambassadors in that sense with Christ for them if we don't do that then we easily run the risk of that happening how many times I don't know, I'm not the judge but how many times as somebody in our community or somebody through time in a church that you've been involved with. How many times have you seen somebody that came in? It was evident. They wanted to do what's right. They loved the Lord. They wanted to be a part of the fellowship. And then they got turned off. Why? What turned them off? It might be, it could be that the world, they weren't ready to come out of the world, but probably not. A lot of times. A lot of times it's because what they saw when they came in. So people, let's be the congregation that's loving, that's caring, that's welcoming, that's kind, you know, doing good to all people. Especially, as Mike pointed out, making up in Galatians, especially those in the household of faith. And if they see us being that way, as a body, as his family, I think it'll be powerful. And I think they'll want to stay and be a part of it. So really all this comes down to, and I think another attitude that we need to catch. Yes, Mike. Uh, most of the time, and I think that fits into the hypocrite part of that, people pay more attention to what you do than what you say. Right. Right. They, you know, when somebody's new, they're going to they're gonna pay attention, and they're going to see what you do in the community, too. And so that all fits in as well. Right. Good point. They're not going to listen too much to what we say until they see what we do. Uh, or sometimes what we say will run them off if they don't see us doing it, which is kind of the other side. of it. So really it seems to me we ought to come down to the attitude as we think about reaching out to the community, the world around us, that we need to have a real strong attitude that it's not us versus them, but it's us reaching out in love 
and serving. I, if I was going to preach on evangelism, I'd, I'd start right here, I believe. That's where we ought to start, is we reach out and love. And so that's one reason I believe that it's so prevalent now that most of the success in evangelism is by friend, what we call friendship evangelism. is because it's relationship. It's pulling them in uh, for that kind of thing. So as we look at all of this, I think, I think this says to us very clearly that there's three things. All of us don't have the ability to be preachers. All of us don't have the ability to be evangelists, and you'll see that as we move on into the family. All of us don't have the ability to do a lot of things, a good job of it that will cause people to grow and mature and be what they ought to be. But there's at least three things that we can all do, and I think that's what we ought to focus on. We can all be a person who does good to all men. Anybody can't do that? We can all do that, can't we? We can all... As 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, that we read a while ago, points out, we can all be people who tell people for the hope that's within us when they ask us. If they're asking us, why don't you get mad when somebody mistreats you? Why didn't you put old so-and-so in place when he slandered you or he cut you down? There's the time to say, this is why. That's not who I am. That's not what being in the Lord is all about. And so we can all do that. We can all tell anybody we come in contact with. If they ask us, if we can't, we better figure it out right quick. But if we can't tell people for the hope that's within us, then we're in trouble for sure. We can all do that, can't we? And the last thing John 3, 13 verse 35 says, as Jesus pointed out when he said the whole command comes down to two things. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to say, by this all men will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. We can all love if we want to. So those are three things that as we think about, it seems to me that must be there when we start thinking about reaching out to the community and the world. We can do those three things. We can do good. We can give an answer. And we can focus on showing love to everybody. If we'll do that, I believe we're going to have a lot of effect. So as children of God then, we become people who honor, who do good, who love, and I'm just covering the things we've talked about, so I'm not making a new list. Who bless people, who serve all men as best we can. And it all comes down to the scripture we looked at last week that we come to the point in our life, in our congregation, that we treat people like others would like others to treat us. Think about that. If I'm making a mistake, how do I want you to treat me? Cut me down, call me stupid, call me idiot, or whatever you're tempted to do. No, you really want the best. If you want anything out of me, it's to do good to me, to help me, to bring me through it. Our basic attitude then, it seems to me, the kind of people that we are is this kind of people, as God's children. People that treat others, just simply to pull it all together, that treat others just like we would like to be treated. Mistake, good, or whatever, we treat them like we would like to be treated. Uh, but the treatment of the brothers and sisters, if you look at the second section of this lesson, the treatment of the brothers and sisters is even better. Because as we looked at and we covered that, as brothers and sisters, we are focused on bearing each other's weakness. And remember, I, I don't want to let that <laughs> drift out of my mind. Bearing is not putting up with. Bearing is covering. It's helping. We bear weaknesses, each other. We edify each other. We live harmoniously with each other. We're sympathetic with each other. We're kind-hearted. We're brotherly. We're humble in spirit. That's a Christian. That's a special relationship. Much deeper. Much more involved. And no wonder it says, Mike, in Galatians, especially 
to the household of faith. It's special that we have that kind. So I don't want to get into preaching. That's, that's Tim's job, but uh, <laughs> I'd like to encourage each of us. Dan, I have a question. Yes. Absolutely. I think that's a really good point, Mike. This has to be something that comes out of our heart, comes out of deep within us, uh, because we're doing it because we have to. We might as well not be doing it, really. Uh, and so that's very important. It has to be something that we do because it's our heart. It's our nature. But if we really realize who we are in Christ, and I, I think you'll see this so clearly when we move into that next section, that we realize what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ, what the family is about, then that becomes, how could we want anything else? How we could ever think about it? Lorona gave me this little article, a little thing she read somewhere, probably on Facebook, because she's always sending pictures on Facebook, but I wouldn't laugh at her or anything about it. But, uh, but this is good. It says, when you have a friend that's going through a storm, don't broadcast it. Get an umbrella and cover them. Yeah. That's what it's all about. That's what reaching out, that's what the relationship is all about in the church and our relationship in the world. When someone's in a storm, don't make the storm worse. Cover them. Protect them. That's especially true with us in the church, right? So I, I hope... And I, you're not interested in pleasing me, I'm sure, but I hope as we move forward in this congregation that I never hear anybody cutting anyone else down, not covering them. Even when they've made a mistake, that kindness, that tenderheartedness, that sympathetic, that brotherly feeling should always prevail. And so I hope we leave here tonight, if we get nothing else out of this class the whole time, I hope we leave with the attitude that that's the kind of people I want to be. And I think that's what the Lord wants of us. I think that's what being a Christian is all about. But any thought or question now before we leave that section? Okay, the next section, and we'll go ahead and start because we've got about six, seven minutes, so I want to go ahead so I don't go into June with this thing anyway. Uh, the next section is Roman number five, if you're looking in your outline there. A family type of fellowship. God's family. And the first thing I see as we look at that, I think it becomes very clear that that begins with a focused heart. And we've talked about that so much that, you know, I hope you're starting to say, this, this guy's saying the same thing over and over. I bet I am. This becomes very critical. That we, as we look at the family, if we look at the relationship that we have in Christ, it needs to begin at a certain place with a focused heart. And what should that focus be? Let's turn to Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7. Somebody read that when you get there. Okay, verse 5 says, he adopted us as sons. And so what does he do? He sends, listen closely, he sends forth his spirit, where? In our hearts. That does what? Cries, Abba, Father. So when we see ourselves, if I'm hearing this right, when we see ourselves as his son, we begin right there in our heart with 
He's saying in our spirit. His spirit is saying within our heart. Abba, Father. I'm a son of God. I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the Creator. I'm a child of the Almighty. Whatever you want to assign to God. Who am I? What does he say? What does he put in my heart? He puts in my heart saying, crying out. That's more than just saying, well, that's true. It seems to me like it's much, much deeper than that. He places his spirit within our heart that cries out, Abba, Father. Now, what's that saying to us? We kind of read through that and a lot of times just let it become just, well, yeah, he's God. He's our Father. What does Abba, Father, really say? Daddy. That's the thing a kid does right away. If he in any way looks up to his father, if he's in any way has any trust in his father, one of the first things a kid will say is dada or daddy. You know, my, I guess I'm lucky or unlucky, I don't know. But my kids still call me daddy a lot. Let me illustrate this to you with, and I hate to talk about my kids all the time, but I think it's so important. Uh, that we really see it. Uh, when we see God in such a way as he's our daddy, yes, he's our father. It's Abba Father. But there's a reason Abba's in there. Because that's a special relationship. As I was <clears throat> younger, I went hunting a lot. Uh, too much, Lerona said. But I went hunting a lot. And naturally the boys wanted to go with us. So when they got old enough to kind of track along, well, we went up to the ranch where I grew up and up in this particular place where I knew there were going to be some deer because i have been there all my life. I knew where they stayed, you know. And so I told them we got out of the truck and we got, I got loaded up and the boys were with me just all excited and everything. And they, uh, I said, now boys, there's going to be some deer on top of this, so you be real careful. Walk real quietly as we go in. So we walked in, and I happened to glance back, and those boys were trying to step in my footsteps. Every step that we took. I'm a father. Daddy. They wanted to walk in the steps of their daddy. They still. And you, those of your parents, maybe your kids do that too. I hope they do. They still call daddy when they want something, when they really need something. It's Daddy, what about my car? I can't get it started. <laughs> and I talk to him, well, what's wrong? We talk through it. Nine times out of 10, they already figured it out. But they wanted Daddy's input. That's Abba. I believe people, that's the relationship, that's the attitude, that's the spirit that we ought to have towards God. I'm afraid that many times we're so much, we make him so abstract, we make him so pie in the sky that we miss this spirit within our heart that is crying. Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. That's the one I look to. That's the one I trust. And if we don't start there, if we don't start with Abba, Father, then our family relationship, if he's really not the Father, the Daddy, of our congregation, then this congregation or any congregation that tries to be a congregation is in trouble. Because without the Father, without Daddy, Father, somebody that has that special relationship. And so I hope that as we leave here tonight, and we'll, uh, we'll stop here because our time is up. But I hope you'll think about that as we move to next week, that we should always keep that in our heart. That should be our focus. That's where we start. That's God's place in our heart and in the family, the body. He's our Abba Father. And if we make him that, if we make him the one, if I can use my kids as an example, that we were interested in walking in his footsteps, that we go to when we're in trouble, when we go to when there's something we don't understand, we don't know what to do about it, if we go to him, Daddy, Father, the one we trust, then I can guarantee you that we're going to have a relationship with this congregation.
that's dear and precious. And we won't have to worry about fussing and fighting. We won't have to worry about all the things that, that come to happen. But until we get that attitude, until we get that spirit in our heart, and I'm not saying we don't have or whatever. We've got a lot of neat things here in this congregation. But I think it's so important to realize it. Lorona, did you want to come in? Anyone else? You know, tear them up. I don't know why. <laughs> it's precious, isn't it? When we see God that way, as his children, he loves me so much that he places himself within my heart, the seat of my affections, my desires, in a place that he calls, that I call him. I hear him saying, Daddy, Father, we're on the right track. Yes, Kim. The fact that in that verse there that all this blew my mind and it humbled me beyond repair. And whenever I think about what what he's saying there, he's made us heirs and joint heirs with his son. I, you know, that he has elevated us by his righteousness, not ours. He has elevated us. Not we haven't elevated ourselves, but we don't have anything to do with that. But he has raised us up. Right. Yeah, and even deeper than that, Ken, that's very much true, and that's the whole context of what he's bringing out. But as he does that, as he adopts us as that son, he places this spirit within our heart that tells this relationship. That's what's important. And so I just feel so strongly that we need to catch this deep within us, that we start to see God in that way. Yes, he's the Almighty. Yes, he's the Creator, Ken, like you're saying. He did give us airship. He did make us to be his children. But he sends that spirit into our heart that says, I'm it. I'm daddy. I'm father. I'm the one you can depend on. When times are tough, I'm the one that loves you so much <laughs> that I gave myself for you, for you, and on and on we could go. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? Tim, you want to listen to prayer?